All right, everyone, it looks like we are live. Well, welcome to the Water Finance and Management webinar series. My name is Andrew Farr. I am the Managing Editor of Water Finance and Management. So it's a pleasure to have you with us this afternoon. I am going to be just hosting things and moderating and keeping things on track. Um, so I would first like to introduce the title of our presentation today, Maximizing the Financial Value of Advanced Metering Projects. This presentation is sponsored today by UMS. And so I'm going to get a little bit more into our topic here in, in just a minute and, and sort of set things up for us, but I just wanna go through a couple housekeeping items. Uh, first, we are going to launch a, a poll question. You should be seeing that pop up on your screen right now. Uh, this just helps uh, helps us get a better idea of everyone who's on with us this afternoon. So if you wouldn't mind answering that and then clicking the blue return to presentation button, we would really appreciate it. I want to mention questions uh, throughout the presentation. Uh, if you're if you're on with us today, you can submit questions for our our two presenters at any time. We're going to do a little Q&A session at the end once these guys are done, and we will get through as many questions as we can. So uh, you don't have to wait until the end to submit those. Um, if any questions come up throughout, feel free to, to type those in. So once again, our, our topic for today, maximizing the, the financial value of advanced metering projects. This topic is, is right up our alley for uh, water finance management webinars. We we cover a lot of uh, a lot of AMI projects, a lot of smart metering implementation, uh, and and of course there's a huge there's there's of course a cost component there's a cost involved with these projects, but they are very much geared towards uh, bolstering utility revenue and efficiency and and all that good stuff. Uh, so it really encompasses uh, a lot of areas that we like to touch on. Uh, with our coverage. So we're going to talk about how you can get the most value out of AMI, advanced metering programs, um, total cost of ownership, and really how you can get return on investment for these projects. So without further delay, let me introduce our two presenters for today. We have Jacob Jasperson, Senior Advisor for UMS, and Jacob works with utilities and municipalities to help them identify their business objectives and needs and implement solutions that provide the best resolutions for their needs. He has worked in the municipal utility industry for over 12 years. And then we are also going to be joined a little later by Mike Nikes, Southeast Regional Manager with Water Company of America. And Mike also has a background working with the city of Gulfport as Director of Administration and Finance. Uh, so Jacob, Mike, uh, really great to have both of you on with us today. Jacob, I believe you're going to kick things off for us today. So I will go ahead and turn things over to you. Perfect. Thanks, Andrew. Appreciate the introduction and uh, appreciate everybody hopping on. So I'm I'm very excited. I know Mike and I are both excited for this this topic and for this conversation. Hopefully, uh, hopefully you guys don't think this is a, a bait and switch here because we're definitely going to talk about the financial considerations with deploying advanced metering projects. But we're also going to try to hit on some of the non-financial components that at the end of the project or during the deployment of the project can help to make the the financial return even better with some of these projects. And and Mike is going to jump in with with some exciting real life examples of how he put this into practice at, at Gulfport. So real briefly, I'm just going to touch on the agenda here quickly. Um, I'm going to give a very brief overview of AMI. I think everybody's familiar with it at this point. Um, we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about it. I'm going to talk um, mainly about the topic of ROI on AMI, which I know is a mouthful, right? But um, talk about why it's an important, uh, an important consideration to look at and why we need to factor in financial and non-financial considerations when we look at, at those returns on projects. Then Mike is going to talk to us a little bit about how he did this in practice at, at Golfport. And then we're going, to we're going to segue a little bit and talk about what happens next, right? Everybody loves to talk about these AMI projects through the lens of, you know, how do I maximize the deployment? How do I make sure that I'm getting the biggest bang for my buck as I'm deploying this technology? Well, we all know that after the technology gets deployed, you still have to, to utilize it and maintain it in order to, to make it functional. So we're going to talk a little bit about what some of those after deployment considerations are. 
And then finally, we're going to wrap up with a conversation around using service contracts and, and different services in order to help improve outcomes for, for AMI. And we're definitely going to try to leave some time for questions. So as Andrew mentioned, feel free to start dropping questions in there, and um, we'll make sure we, we leave time for those at the end. So AMI overview, again, very brief um, overview on, on what is AMI or advanced metering infrastructure. It, it's interesting. I was talking to a utility superintendent just the other day, and we were talking about upgrading to advanced metering. And he made the comment to me, which I've heard before, but, but it was very timely because we had this, this webinar coming up. He made the comment to me that, you know, it's really no longer a matter of if you upgrade to an AMI system, it's a matter of when. And so, you know, I think that, that with all this talk around AMI and having it, you know, really almost be a matter of certainty, um, I think there still is, in large part, a little bit of a misunderstanding of what the true benefit of upgrading to AMI is. And so why do you want to do an upgrade to advanced metering uh, systems? Well, there's a lot of different conversations around the features and the benefits and, and what all goes into it. Um, Realistically, as, as we kind of sit back and think of what all of those benefits are, there's really only five true benefits. There's a lot of other kind of, I'd say, secondary or tertiary benefits that fall into these buckets, but, but realistically, all of the benefits kind of fall into these, these five main buckets. So I'll just walk through them very quickly. Reliable and accurate meter reading. This is one of the main reasons why a lot of utilities move to AMI. They want to make sure that they're getting reliable, accurate reads. They want to make sure they're getting their bills out on a timely fashion. Visibility into your distribution system health, so being able to look at different conditions within your distribution network and how consumption is impacting that distribution. Visibility into customer usage trends, so being able to identify leaks, water theft, conservation issues, things like that. Enhanced customer communication satisfaction, so getting that information to your end customers in a way that is trustworthy and reliable so that they, they can take advantage of that information. And then last but not least, resource allocation efficiency. And, and really what we mean by resource allocation efficiency is making sure that you've got the right people doing the right jobs within, within your utility. So at its most basic level, AMI, and again, not spending a ton of time here, but AMI is really just a way that you can take consumption and exception data from water meters that are connected to some sort of transmitting device, communicating that back through some sort of network into some sort of meter data management software system for analysis and billing. That's really what it is. There's a lot of variations on that. There's a lot of different um, types of networks and types of communication devices, but at its bo most basic level, that's really what we're talking about. So just to make sure we're kind of all level setting on, on what AMI is and how it actually works. And so, the last analogy I'm going to use here, I don't know if anybody else is a, a Formula One fan here. Um, I was never a, a fan of, of really any sort of racing until when COVID hit, I, like many other people, started watching a lot more Netflix. And one of the uh, documentary series that was on Netflix is a series called Drive to Survive. And if you haven't had a chance to check it out, I highly recommend you do. It's excellent, um, but it, it chronicles all of the, the Formula One races through through several different years. And it really kind of kickstarted or catapulted the, the Formula One, um, you know, racing industry within the United States. It, it wasn't a huge, wasn't a huge sport here in the United States, really, until that the Drive to Survive series came out. And it struck me as I was watching the series how similar Formula One is to advanced metering upgrade programs. And you guys are probably saying like that, I don't, only, only a water industry person would immediately draw an analogy between racing and advanced metering upgrade programs, right? But the reality is, you know, anybody that, that's familiar with Formula One understands that when it's done correctly, both Formula One cars and advanced metering upgrade programs can have huge efficiencies over the old way of doing things, really make you more efficient, more effective at, at how you were doing things previously. Both leverage the latest and greatest technology, and both have the ability to make a lot of money for um, the teams and for the utilities that, that utilize them successfully. The challenges, though, are also very similar. So anybody that's familiar with Formula One knows that every single year, every team has to completely deconstruct their car and completely recreate it from scratch. They can't use any of the old 
drawings, designs, anything like that. So it, everything is done from scratch every single year. Well, that's very similar to the way historically a lot of AMI programs were constructed, right? Everything was kind of built from scratch. You took a lot of different parts from a lot of different um, manufacturers, a lot of different parts and pieces from different manufacturers. Um, it also requires a lot of regular changes on the part of the owners and the operators to, to manage all those different all those different changes and all the different components that go into it. Um, cost, right? I know we're on a water finance and management webinar, right? Both are, are expensive. Uh, both Formula One and AMI upgrade programs are expensive. But the big sim similarity is around the maintenance requirement. So both a Formula One car and an advanced metering upgrade program require regular ongoing maintenance to operate effect effectively. And we're going to touch on the maintenance thing um, later on in the presentation, but when you combine all of that together, this is really the reason why utilities have never been able to look at these upgrade packages holistically, right? If we think about an advanced metering upgrade program, um, ideally the way, to, the way to implement it would be to look at it holistically across the entire utility, and we really haven't been able to do that to date. And a lot of that has to do with the the technology requirements of it. A lot of it has to do with turnover within the utility, right? So you've got a constant cycle of retraining and transferring ownership. A lot of it has to do with, with the funding and the financing component. These projects are expensive. So let's get into the uh, the, the, the meat of the, the presentation here. So ROI on AMI. And I'm going to try to limit the number of acronyms that we that we use here going forward in the presentation. But if you think about advanced metering programs historically, in many situations, and anybody that's on the, the webinar that's gone through an advanced metering program may be able to attest to this, but in many situations, the projects fail, even after the money itself has been allocated. Um, and when I say fail, I don't mean that they break or that they've got to get pulled out and something new comes in. I mean that they don't necessarily meet their intended goal of, of what they were trying to do. And so why is that? Well, I would argue that in most cases, it's not because the dollar amount is prohibitively high, right? It's not because it's a huge capital project, even though it is, um, but that's not why a lot of these advanced metering projects don't achieve their desired outcomes. I would argue that in a lot of cases, it's because of internal and external risks and constraints within the utility and, and the technology itself. Um, for starters, these systems themselves are very complex. Uh, we already know that, that uh, there's a lot of different moving parts and pieces. We know that we have an issue with turnover in the utilities. And so you have a situation where nobody really takes ownership of these projects. Um, there's a lot of different types of technologies out there. So this is the, the paradox of choice, right? I've got four, five, six, seven different systems out there all of which have pros and cons, but all of which also lend themselves to different business outcomes. And so I get into a situation where I don't really know what technology to, to deploy or to go with. Um, they're inherently risky projects from a deployment and implementation standpoint. Again, I, we there was a project that I worked on um, in South Carolina, and, and one of the, the water utility uh, guys said it best, where he said, this isn't one project. This is 150,000 micro projects, right? And so when you have a situation where each and every single product that you're putting in impacts your end customer and your, your constituents, that increases the risk of the project substantially. But I would argue the biggest reason that most of these, um, these projects don't achieve their desired outcome is that many, if not most utilities, don't adjust their business processes to the new systems and the technologies that they put in place. They simply continue doing business the way that they've always done it. Um, and I'm not, by the way, not placing blame on the, on the utilities for this. This has been an industry-wide issue and a shift in our approach as, as of late. So this isn't something that utilities didn't do. It's something that we as an industry did a poor job of communicating to cities and municipalities and utilities um, that really to get the desired outcome that you want, you need to look at this as a holistic project, not just a portion of it. Um, and so that, you know, that if that's really why we don't see a lot of advanced metering projects get their desired outcomes, how do we then flip the script and get the desired outcome that we want for our, our AMI projects? So, 
you're probably all wondering, what does this have to do with ROI, right? So you'll notice in the previous slide, when I talk about why these projects fail, um, the high cost of the technology isn't really a, a, a factor in that. It's not really a consideration. In, in fact, in most cases, once you get the initial money appropriated or budgeted for the project, the, the cost component isn't really a hurdle. And so, you know, the real question is, how do you calculate the ROI with something like an advanced metering upgrade project product? So everybody here is financially savvy. Everybody knows the ROI calculation, right? Net profit over net cost. Using a very simplistic example, if I bought 1,000 shares of stock at $10 a share, I sold 1,000 shares of stock at $12.50 per share, I would have a $2.50 net profit on 1,000 shares over a $10 cost on a thousand shares, I've got a 25% ROI, right? Simple enough. Well, what is the profit on an AMI deployment? Sure, you could say that that maybe the profits increase revenue, but realistically, you have the ability to get that even in, if you just change out old mechanical meters to new, newer electronic ones. So what is the real profit on an AMI program? And is this concept of profit maximization even one that we want to consider as we're looking at what the return is on these projects? Of course, you want to make sure that you're allocating capital efficiently and you want to make sure that you are doing all that you can in order to spend those dollars wisely. But for anybody that's ever, for anybody that's ever done an AMI project, I think you would agree that the profit component of it, the revenue maximization component is only one of a handful of, of benefits that you get. So I, I, I've got to give a shout out to a coworker of mine um, who I think is probably on the call, Bryce Wallet. Um, he coined this term. We were kind of kicking this around internally on, on you know, how did we want to pivot this idea of ROI? And he actually coined the term return on advanced metering or ROAM, right? So it's, it's, it's got a nice catchy acronym. It's not a three-letter acronym, which is nice. Um, but we feel like this term really does a much better job of accurately identifying the variables that are involved in an advanced metering changeout program. Um, and also, to my knowledge, it's not been coined before. So um, before anybody steals it, we're thinking of copywriting it. So I'm just going to put that out there. Um, but so the idea is that instead of strictly looking at the financial aspects of it, which can be a bit limiting when you're talking about a project like this, you take the top and the bottom part of the equation and replace it with items that are more specific to AMI. So in this case, we're looking at annual efficiencies gained plus increased capabilities on the top end. And then on the bottom side, deployment costs and annual fees. And so just to kind of give you guys an idea of what some of those might be, right? So in an advanced metering project, efficiencies gained might be time savings, right? It might be cost savings. It could be increased output per unit of time, meaning if it normally would take me eight hours to send out bills for my entire system, and now that I migrated to an AMI system, it takes me two hours, I've got a six-hour you know, cost savings. I've got increased output over whatever that unit of time is. Um, increased capabilities might be something like increasing customer satisfaction or trust, right? So now I have the ability to provide this information to my end customers and end constituents, and they're much more likely to accept that information and realize that, you know, I'm not trying to hide anything from them or, or not trying to, you know, steal more money from them. Um, you know, it could be something like regulatory compliance, right? Now I have the increased ability to do more from a regulatory compliance standpoint versus on the bottom end of that equation, deployment costs. So obviously direct costs, everybody knows that there's a direct cost associated with, deploying an AMI system, cost of the equipment, cost of the software. There's also cost in terms of resource resources needed to do the uh, procurement process, resources to do the planning, resources to do the, the business, business system reviews. Um, and then any system is going to have those ongoing annual fees, right? So you're going to have software fees, you're going to have hardware upgrade fees, you're going to have ongoing maintenance. So this equation, I think, gives us a, a good framework for how to think about these AMI projects. The nice thing about this equation is that um, it increases exponentially over time, if you think about it, right? So once you deploy an advanced metering system, 
the top half of that equation continues to grow and compound on each on itself year over year over year, right? So if you're looking at this on a let's say 10 year time frame, um, you're going to continue to get those annual efficiencies gained over a 10 year period. So the top half of that equation keeps getting bigger and bigger. The bottom half will get bigger um, or stay the same, but at a much lower rate, right? So you've got one time deployment costs. Once you do that, that cost is fixed. You don't have to incur that cost again. Yes, you do have those ongoing annual fees like software fees and maintenance, um, but those are kind of going at a static pace. They're not necessarily increasing, or at least if they are increasing, they're not increasing at the same rate as at the top half of that equation. So um, that's kind of how we, we've been thinking about this concept of return on advanced metering. Now, to be clear, I'm not recommending that anybody go out and actually try to calculate this number, right? It would be, A, very difficult to, to come up with an accurate calculation of it, and B, it wouldn't really mean much, right? We don't have a benchmark. I have no idea if a, if a good return on advanced metering is 25% or 250%, right? I, there's no benchmark of what a good uh, ratio would be, but it's really more of kind of an intellectual exercise to help us think through the, the pros and cons of advanced metering deployment. So again, if we go back to our initial question of why AMI, and we take those five benefits that we outlined in the beginning, and now we pair them up with specific features, we can start to see what some of those efficiencies that that we would be looking at um, look like when we're looking when we're weighing different options for for advanced metering deployments or types of technologies. So, for example, enhanced customer communication satisfaction. That's always a a, a big one, especially for um, you know, utilities that are trying to sell this to city councils or boards or mayors, right? They want to know what are my constituents going to get out of this. Um, we can tie that benefit directly to a feature within an AMI system of having a customer portal or the ability to email or SMS text alert from, from the system. Take it one step further, and now if we tie that feature and benefit to a success metric, right? So, enhanced customer communication, I've got a customer portal or the ability to, to communicate via email or SMS text. Now I tie that to a success me metric of that's gonna lead to a decreased time for me to respond to my customers. Well, now I've got a tangible metric that I can identify at the onset of an AMI deployment and something I can measure against throughout the deployment to determine how successful it was. And again, we talked at the beginning about why, why AMI projects fail. Um, really the way to think about these projects is not on a binary pass fail. It's really more of a continuum, right? So what we're really looking for here is a metric that can quantify how successful these deployments are. Um, and so now we start to stack these success, me success metrics together on the top half of that equation that we had versus the implementation lift on the bottom half of the equation. So all of this is, is, is really to say there are, of course, legitimate costs associated to implementing an AMI system. And obviously, from a financial standpoint, we want to be able to quantify what kind of return we're getting when we deploy capital to do this type of a system. Um, what we really are trying to drive towards here is the idea that, yes, there are financial components of that. But if we can also start to implement some of these success metrics, and, and these success metrics are going to be different for each individual deployment, right? Each city and municipality are going to have their own specific metrics that they want to track and they want to compare pre-deployment pre to post-deployment um, to justify the staff time, the resources, the capital dollars, all of that stuff. So um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Mike because he's going to talk about kind of how this works, work or how this worked in practice, how he took kind of this theoretical concept of of return on advanced metering and put it into practice in Gulfport. Thank you, Jacob. So a little bit about the city of Gulfport. Um, first of all, I was the finance director uh, from around. Uh, 2000, year 2000, 2013, and uh, I retired in 2013 to explore other careers. So um, about the city of Gulfport, city of Gulfport in Mississippi, second largest city in Mississippi, 70,000 population, about 26,000 water meters of which all of them were being manually read, and our utility fund had a, a annual revenue of $24 million. Okay, Jake. 
so why move to uh, to the AMI program? So uh, city of Gulfport was right on ground zero with Hurricane Katrina in 2005. Um, had a brand new mayor at the time, so basically his first four the four years post Katrina, we were uh, doing everything we could to try to rebuild the city and do 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 things like that. So we were in a crisis mode. So in um, two, 2009, we kind of got into uh, somewhat of a financial crisis. The the overall economy on the on the, in the local area and on the national uh, area was uh, really going going haywire. We costs were up, gas fuel, fuel kind of similar to what we're going through now. And our revenue started taking a plunge in the city of Gulfport. Uh, we were on a Katrina Hurricane Katrina high, and that everything that was damaged was being rebuilt. But but as the rebuilding ended, everything started going back down, sales tax and so forth and so on. So we were looking for creative ways to bring additional money into the city of uh, Gulfport. So uh, everyone was looking at where we could cut budgets or where we could enhance our revenues. That was the, the major uh, component we were looking at there. So we decided uh, that our water meters were, we never went through a, a, a citywide meter change out program in, in Gulfport, never. It, we were just buying meters along the way. So the ones that were originally in the ground, twenty had been in the ground 25 years were st was still there. We had no idea what kind of revenue that we were missing from uh, those old meters. Uh, meters, as, as everyone understands, is a mechanical device. And over time, a mechanical device tends to slow down. It never speeds up. So our goal was to uh, replace all 26,000 water meters. And at the same time, we were reading those meters with, with m manually. Meter readers going, popping lids, writing the meter uh, information down on the reads. Reads were getting manually keyed into the, the uh, billing software. So that, that was an antiquated process all to begin with. So the, the two things is we wanted to replace our meters. We felt like we'd see a revenue enhancement from that. Secondly, we needed to go a step into the 21st century and, and, and start using the technologies that were available at that time. The anticipated benefits was um, we wanted to, uh, I, I felt like without a question, we would increase our revenues, but I didn't know how much the revenues would increase. So from a budget standpoint, I figured conservatively, we would increase our revenues by 10%. That ended up being a lot more, which I'll show you subsequently in, uh, in a couple of slides down. Uh, our unaccounted for water at that point in time was around 46%, meaning that we could only account, uh, uh, we could only account roughly for half the water that we produced from our, from our wells. And when I say account for, based on what we bill, the gallons that we build out versus the, the gallons that we produced. So we were losing about half was, was all we could account for. Um, we uh, wanted to, we felt like that implementing a, uh, an AMI system, we'd experience cost savings uh, from personnel. Now we didn't lay anyone out off, but we just did a managed attrition program as tire. We, we uh, either didn't fill the position or we, we transferred other folks into those positions. And over time we were able to create cost savings from the um, AMI system and then better customer service, uh, service through detection. Uh, that was really a, a, a positive there where we were able to customers that, you know, you probably have a leak inside your house. You may want to get a plumber to, to check it out because your meter has been running solid for 24 hours. So that leak detection uh, was a tremendous benefit uh, with our citizens. So the financial impact from the change out in the city of Gulfport uh, and keep in mind, the uh, city of Gulfport is small compared to a lot of these cities that's taking part in this, this webinar. We, we had, like I say, 26,000 meters in the ground. And from when the meter change out was uh, substantially complete, we uh, experienced an annual increase in revenue of $4 million. I was thinking it was going to be somewhere around two. Half of that is what I went into the, the plan presenting, but it ended up being 20%. Annual cost savings, 250000 there. Uh, I think we eliminated... Uh, four meter reader jobs that we never replaced. Um, the annual debt payment, we had to actually borrow $9 million for this project. And the annual debt payment 10-year uh, payback was $1.2 million. And then the annual cash flow increase as a result of this whole entire project was uh, over $3 million. And I just felt like that was amazing for a city of 70,000 population, 26,000 meters. Uh, at the end of the day, I was really pleased with how this project went. Uh, uh, it exceeded expectations. This graph here illustrates 
illustrates uh, the blue. The blue line is the uh, the gallons that were produced, monthly gallons that were produced. The red line were the actual gallons that we could account for that we build through our billing system. As you can see, prior to the meter changeout program being uh, complete, it, it uh, was around 43% unaccounted for water. Um, as we substantially closed out the program, which took six to seven months to actually you know, change all the meters out, it was a six or seven, seven month time, time frame, our unaccounted for water went to 22%. And I said earlier that our uh, water and sewer utility fund revenues were about 24 million. So you can see where that 4 million comes from, from the, the 20 plus percent swing. Or, we're, billing, we're now billing water that we, uh, uh, we were not billing before. So when you add the sewer component on top of that, uh, that's where the $4 million is coming from there. So uh, in, in any metric from a city of Gulfport's perspective, any metric that you, you want to measure this product project by was a success. And that's not always the case when you're dealing with government entities. But uh, I was really pleased and proud when I walked away from the city uh, three years after this project was complete that uh, I had that in the rear view mirror and it was a, it was a successful project for the citizens of Gulfport. Perfect. Thank, thanks, Mike. Um, that, that's great real world examples of, of kind of how some of these, these topics come into consideration or come into practice. And, and, you know, I think you, you hit on a couple of things there that kind of echoed what we talked about in the previous slide, but, you know, one of which being kind of that resource allocation piece, right? So being able to, um, you know, appropriately allocate resources within the utility, not necessarily meaning that you're going to eliminate jobs, um, but making sure you've got the right people in the in the right place, um, I, I think is is key. And I think, you know, one of the things that I know you're going to talk about in a little bit is, um, you know, not just the during deployment considerations, but after deployment, right? So, Mike did a great job in, in Gulfport of maximizing the, the value of, of that project on the front end. Well, what happens after that after that project gets gets deployed, right? Um, we need a way to ensure that the projects continue to run efficiently. And I think that's really, you know, one of the key takeaways here in this presentation is um, in order to maximize the financial value of an advanced metering deployment, you have to think about what happens after the deployment is done. Um, you know, it's it's just as important as planning on the on the front end. So you know, if we think about this advanced metering deployment uh, scenario here, right, we, we walked through this already, but we've got a water meter with a transmitter and a reading network going back into, into a software. And when it's working properly, I've got a transmitter that's transmitting to a reading network. Um, I've got a reading network that's bringing the information back into a meter data management system. That software is updating a consumer portal that's providing information. It's working great, hassle-free, right? Well, the, the question is, what happens when that transmitter stops working, right? Or what happens when there's a break in the software um, that doesn't provide the information to the consumer portal? Or what happens when the water meter stops transmitting, right? These are all things that happen fairly regularly with advanced metering deployments, and they're all additional costs that are associated with maintaining your system after you put it into place. So... What do we mean by maintenance? What what exactly is is maintenance? Well, I think everybody here, you know, kind of intuitively knows what we mean by maintenance. But just to make sure that that we're all kind of on the same page, um, maintenance means regularly reviewing your software system to identify any exceptions um, or hardware in the system that that's not providing information back. Maintenance means actively pulling equipment out of service that is not functioning properly and making sure that it gets back to the appropriate manufacturer to be replaced or repaired under warranty, right? Maintenance means continually testing your meters to ensure that um, that, the, that the meters are, are running accurately, particularly your large meters, right? Large commercial and industrial meters have a tendency to lose accuracy more so than smaller residential meters because there's more usage going through it. Um, and maintenance also means ongoing training um, and, and really doing that business process review. And again, this is where I think a lot of utilities, by no fault of their own, but a lot of utilities miss the portion of doing that ongoing business process review to make sure that you know how we're doing business today isn't the same as how we were doing it before we had advanced metering, right? And and you know the 
the the worst case scenarios that we hear um, at UMS uh, are utilities that you know they they spend all of this time and money and effort to put these advanced metering programs or 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 uh, projects in place and then continue to just simply provide one billing read per month or per quarter, right? So, you know, if you want to talk about maximizing your, your ROI on an advanced metering project, that's a surefire way to make sure that you get the least amount of benefit for the dollars that you're putting in, right? So making sure that you're taking advantage of all of the different um, you know, components and, and information that comes back through, through these advanced metering projects. Um, and again, that's something that is just as important to build into the front end of the project um, as your cost analysis, right? You want to make sure that you have a plan in place and, and money budgeted to do that ongoing maintenance. And then the next question that invariably comes up is, how long do I have to maintain the system for? Well, the short answer is for the entire life of the system, right? You're going to need to be providing constant maintenance on these these systems. So I'm I might be uh, I might be be dating myself here and, and kind of showing my age, but um, everybody remember that that infomercial with Ron Papelli uh, for the rotisserie, rotisserie oven, right? Um, if we were live in a in a room, you, you guys would all probably all remember the tagline, right? But set it and forget it. You know, that was his whole big thing with that rotisserie oven. Um, that's the opposite of what you want to do with these with these advanced metering systems, right? It's not something that you can just set in the ground, walk away and, and forget about. Um, and the reason for that, and I think it's important to kind of hit on this a little bit, but the reason for that is because really what we're talking about here is everybody talks about an advanced metering upgrade program as one project. Well, the reality is this is really three separate projects, right? You've got a construction project where you're actually physically putting things in the ground, taking old meters out, putting new meters in. Maybe you're putting towers or gateways or data collectors up. Um, but it's a it's a construction project. You have an IT project because you're integrating all the different software. Um, you're integrating your GIS, your CIS, your meter data management system, your customer portal, all these different software pieces that need to talk to each other, pass information back and forth. And then once you have all of those integrated, now you need a way to view all of that information in real time to make it actionable, right? And then the third program is really a business transformation project. Again, taking the way that you were doing business when you were manually reading meters or reading via a drive-by system and changing that process so that you're taking advantage of all the different bells and whistles that come along with these with these AMI systems. And so, um, you know, I think the, the one point that that I think is, is worth hitting on again, um, part of the reason why utilities really need to approach these projects as a whole scale change out in order to maximize the return on your AMI system is for this reason, right? All of these different projects, this construction, IT, business transformation project, all of them work interdependently within each other. And so, you know, what, what we see a lot of utilities do is they'll say, well, I'm going to maybe phase this in over a five-year period, right? Or I'm going to maybe start with my, my metering system, and then I'm going to upgrade my billing system. Um, or, hey, I'm going to do the, the CIS first, and then we'll get to the, to the AMI project. Uh, and the reality is that in order to really benefit from all of the, the components of these change-out programs, they need to be done holistically because of all of these, these different interdependencies. So, you know, the, the, the next question then becomes, well, how do I do that, right? How can I practically balance all of the moving parts and, and pieces of this change-out program um, while keeping in mind that this is a, a, a large capital expense, right? This is a big project for most, for most cities, most utilities, probably one of the biggest projects that they're, that they're going to do. Um, and so one of the ways that, that you know, we've found that, that utilities can really maximize their return is by utilizing service contracts for some or all of the advanced metering deployments. And so Mike is going to talk a little bit about, you know, what they did at Gulfport with a services contract. And then I'll talk a little bit more about, um, you know, some other types of services contracts that, that can be helpful for these deployments. But Mike, if you want to hit on, on what you guys did in Gulfport there. 
Yeah, I came across as finance director for Gulfport. I was attending um, Government Finance Officers Association uh, Conference in Fort Lauderdale, Florida in around 2009. And I came across this company, uh, Water Company of America, and basically uh, it was explained to me that uh, we provide professional services in the area of identifying unbilled water and sewer, meaning that we're, we want to identify water and sewer that you should be billing for that you're not. So I asked the question, I said, well, how much does this service cost? They said, it costs absolutely nothing. I said, okay, so what's the catch? So the, it was explained to me that it's strictly a performance fee contract, meaning that Water Company of America is only paid from the additional revenue that's created as a result of their work. So for example, if they find a, a hundred dollars that you should be billing that you're not, they're only entitled to, let's say, 50% of that amount for an extended period of time, like four years. So uh, uh, you, have to, you have to bill it, you have to collect it, and then water companies pay its, its share. So I've never heard of a, a, uh, anything like this before. I mean, you hire consultants at cities, and they want to charge you the $150 to $200 an hour to come do work. And I have a company here offering to do work and only get a share of the, of the, of the piece of pie that they create. So... Uh, uh, it was explained to me, a water company of America has been in business for years. It was formed to help folks in the area of the uh, utilities, water and sewer specifically. Uh, examples of the types of things that uh, Water Company of America look for is uh, unknown meters not being billed. you got a meter in the ground. Uh, uh, it's just not in the billing system. I'll give you a case study on that in a second. Um, uh, unmetered connections. You have fire lines that go into buildings. These fire lines typically uh, are not metered. And as construction is taking place, you'd be amazed how often that the domestic water is, is, is coming through the fire line and it's not being metered. And open emergency bypass valves. Uh, these are put in place so that meters can be changed out without interruption of water to the customer. Oftentimes, these bypass valves get manipulated through by error, just, just you know, or, or, or theft. We found a lot of cases where, where people were still in water by opening the bypass valve and, and let the water go around the meter. And then malfunctioning meters, uh, that's self-explanatory. Rate coding errors. Uh, for example, you may have customer classes that were uh, re that, that were being billed a residential rate, should be billed a commercial rate. Uh, you, you may have a certain rate for restaurants or apartment complexes, and, and these these areas, uh, these customers may not be classified accordingly. Um, incorrect unit counts. A lot of times you use unit counts on apartment complexes uh, to, to calculate into an overall bill. And then a, a service that's not being billed at all. Uh, customers being billed for water usage, but not sewer. Uh, there's a lot of coordination that has to take place when uh, new construction takes place. Uh, typically, they need the water service first, so water gets turned on first, and then at some point in time, the, the building gets a certificate of occupancy, and at that point in time, the sewers uh, uh, should be turned on and, and, and billed for on the sewer. And a lot of times, that paperwork never gets it uh, from the urban development department to the billing department. The billing clerk uh, oftentimes misses putting the sewer charge on the bill. Go to the next one. Okay, so uh, how the system works. Basically, uh, Water Company America makes a discovery on a specific account being underbilled. Document the fine. Secondly, the, the documentation submitted to the entity to approve or reject. Uh, the entity makes the necessary changes to the account, bills the customer accordingly, and then the customer makes the payment to the entity. And only after all of those things take place does Water Company of America then submit a bill to the to the, to the entity for its share of the increased revenue. I, uh, I'm, like I say, I, I was a former finance director for the city of Gulfport and I went to work for Water Company of America. It was just amazing to me what they did in Gulfport after 26,000 new meters in the ground. I, I was gladly able, uh, happy to bring them in because I felt I wanted to affirm something. I felt like we were pretty tight as far as our billing goes. I felt like we were billing our customers fairly and accurately. And I was, I was really wrong about that because at the end of this contract, this contract was for a three-year period of doing field work, uh, they had discovered an additional $2 million of unbilled revenue for the city of Gulfport. And you said, well, how, how did that happen with, with uh, 20, all new meters in the ground? 
we weren't billing sewer. Eighty percent of that money, that two million increase in revenue, had to deal, deal with, uh, with unbilled sewer. There were a lot of folks in the city of Gulfport getting, uh, not getting a sewer bill, but getting a water bill. One of the largest ones was a military base. And make a long story short, they uh, had two wells. They produced their own water. They read their own meters. They call the city of Gulfport with the meter reads every month. We build them based on what the water was produced out of those wells. But come to find out, we the, the wells were reading inaccurately, uh, old meters. Uh, so Water Company America came up with a solution to measure the sewer as it came into the city of Gulfport system. City of Gulfport treated the sewer, so therefore we charged a sewer bill only, didn't charge a water because they produced their own water. But Water Company of America measured that sewer leaving that military installation in two different affluent points to determine that we were underbilling that customer uh, over a half million dollars a year. So that, that was the biggest find in the city of Gulfport and, and it had nothing to do with a water meter. It had to do everything with not billing uh, sewer the amount that it should have been billed. And, and, and most of the fines related to, uh, again, uh, unbilled sewer. So it was amazing to me. They came in and found $2 million uh, after we had just changed out our meters. So yeah, I was happy yeah. to see it though. We had use for the meter. Yeah. And I, okay. I think Mike, that, I think Mike, that, that really speaks to the, you know, what we were talking about earlier, which is just, there are so many different moving parts with these programs, these upgrade programs. Right. And so, you know, to your point, that's something that if, you know, if you guys had just said, Hey, we're going to do a, a standard AMI upgrade program and we're not going to really look at anything else. That's, you know, $2 million of revenue that, that you guys aren't able to capture there. And so, um, you know, I think it, 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 again, speaks to kind of the benefit of looking at these holistically and it speaks to the benefit of, you know, utilizing some of these services contracts to help, um, you know, augment and support what you're doing from, you know, an, an AMI project standpoint. Um, so that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's good stuff. Thank, thanks for that, Mike. Um, so, you know, I, Mike talked a lot about the services contract they're using in Gulfport. I'm just going to wrap up here quickly because I want to make sure we leave time for questions. Um, but you know, what we're seeing in the industry is as these advanced metering projects get more complex and as the cost increases, right? So this very topic of how do you maximize your return on AMI, um, this is a topic because of the fact that AMI deployments and advanced metering deployments are getting more and more expensive, right? And so, um, you know, how do you help mitigate some of that risk or eliminate some of that cost? And, and what we're seeing is there's a number of companies that are, are you know, popping up in the industry uh, that will provide services contracts for some or all of these advanced metering upgrade programs. And, um, you know, that what that will help do from a utility standpoint is it really de-risks the project to the utility, right? And so if you think about the transition from, a capital project to an ongoing operational con, uh, project, um, you're offloading capital dollars to operation, operating expenses. You're you know, in, introducing more predictability from a budgeting standpoint. You're bringing, into, um, you're bringing into the project the ability to exit that contract without penalty. So it really kind of de-risks all of these different um, advanced metering upgrade projects. And, you know, when we talk about this concept of, of risk or, or offsetting risk, um, really we're, we're talking about four main buckets, right? So capital risk, obviously everyone here familiar with that, huge upfront capital costs for a lot of these projects. Um, you know, if you can transition some or all of those uh, components to a services contract, that offloads that capital risk from you as a utility to whoever the service provider is. Um, you know, design risk it, 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 in the case that maybe you put a system in place that doesn't meet the business requirements that that the city has or needs. Um, you know, it allows you to kind of address that or adjust it as you go. Construction risk, meaning the product isn't installed or, or integrated properly. And again, as these projects get more and more complex and larger and larger and more and more capital intensive, that construction risk continues to go up and up and up. And so, you know, offloading some of that risk to a services provider can help to, um, you know, make these projects more palatable to um, governments and, and city councils and mayors and constituents, right? And, and the last one is performance risk, right? So worst case scenario, you get the product installed that doesn't work the way that, that it's supposed to. 
um, using a services contract for that can help to offload the risk of you know the city or the utility being stuck with a bunch of product that doesn't do what it's supposed to. So with that, I think we're going to transition into into questions. But just to kind of close, um, you know, thank you everybody again for your time. Hopefully this was valuable. Um, you know, I think that that we talked about a lot of different things in terms of maximizing return on on AMI. Um, some of them financial, other ones not. So appreciate everybody's time. And uh, Andrew, I'll I'll throw it back over to you for some questions. Yeah, thanks, great. Uh, thanks, Jacob. Great presentation, and uh, also thanks to to Mike for jumping in there and, and giving us uh, golf sports experience. Really, really interesting stuff. Um, so we have a lot of questions coming in. I'm going to try and keep these uh, organized as best I can, so we're not jumping around too much. Uh, but Mike, a couple questions are coming in here just on uh, some clarifications on the meter change out. Maybe you could cover a bit more of this. Um, so can you talk a little bit? about how old the city of golf ports meter inventory was. And so when you started the, the change out were immediate were meters being replaced regularly and, and how long did that all take in total? No, we, uh, so, so the, uh, age of the meters were, were in excess of 25 years old. We, we really did not have a meter change out program, not a good one anyway. Uh, and it was just, uh, absolute, it was worse than what I thought. So, um, old meters, 25 plus years old, no, no set, uh, annual replacement plan whatsoever. And, um, the numbers proved it once we, once we replaced them. Okay. So Jacob, I want to go back to, to the beginning and, and maybe cover a, a point that you mentioned early on. Uh, and this, this, this question came through, I think when you were, um, talking about just kind of the general, you know, your, your, if you could you kind of broke it down into five primary benefits of AMI, but the uh, question on sort of the customer service component, how do you tabulate the financial value of increased customer satisfaction or future proofing, if you will, is that something that you can put a value on or do you have any perspective on that? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a good question. And so I think, um, so I think the short answer is yes, you can. I think the longer answer is, I don't know that. So I think part of, Part of the reason why we wanted to look at this, you know, concept of return on advanced metering rather than return on investment is, you know, I think you get a lot of efficiencies with advanced metering or benefits with advanced metering that are difficult to correlate to um, to actual dollars, but nonetheless still very important for the deployment. So, like customer satisfaction is a perfect example of that, and that's where you know we got into the 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 conversation between you know, benefits and features and then tying it to a success metric. So, you know, I think that that customer satisfaction is a benefit of AMI. I think that, you know, the feature of having that customer portal ties directly with that benefit. I think the success metric of, you know, a decreased time to respond to customers, um, you can you can correlate that success metric to better outcomes within the utility, right? And there's probably ways that you could tie it to a financial component, right? So if you've got, you know, X number of calls coming in, I decrease them by 10%, that's less time that my customer uh, customer uh, service team has to spend on the phone, that's more, times they can, more time they can go do something else, right? So there's probably a way that you could tie it to a financial outcome. I think the broader point though is the benefit of having a, you know, decreased time to respond to customers or a decreased number of customer complaints coming in is almost irrespective of, of price, right? The, there's, there's, a, there's a tangible benefit to that, regardless of whether you're able to, to tie that back to a dollar amount. Are, are you seeing anything being done or, or is UMS working on anything in particular to help encourage, to help like utilities encourage their customers to take advantage of those customer portals uh, more frequently? That's something that I've kind of heard some some things on recently that you know that maybe you know enough of the end users aren't aren't actually using these portals uh, to their to their advantage. Yeah, absolutely, and I think that's another area where um, you know a, a ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, right? So having that conversation on the front end of the project, where as a utility you come in and say, okay, 
We know that this is a benefit. We know that we want to communicate it to our customers. We want to proactively put some sort of public relations campaign in place. We want to tell utility or customers what we're doing, why we're doing it, and how it's going to benefit them. Um, doing that on the front end of the project leads to much better adoption on the back end. And so we've done a lot of projects recently where that's been a main component of it because the utilities realize that it's only going to benefit them to have more people logging into these customer portals. Sure. Okay, Mike, I'm going to come back to you for a couple questions. And we're, we have a couple more, again, just clarifications on, on golf ports work. And I think this one goes back to when you were talking about the, uh, the non-revenue water. Um, do you have any actual utility data that shows a reduction of losses uh, of 15% and, and reduction of consumption? Um, just, just some questions on whether you have actual numbers on those. Uh, you, uh, what I've what I've understood the the average uh, of a really uh, tight system is around fifteen to twenty percent. So mm -hmm. if, if you're if you're in the fifteen to twenty percent range, that's from what I understand a pretty tight system. I mean, you, you're going to okay. have leaks from time to time. You're going to have things that actually happen. So if you're there, that's that's that's, that's excellent. Okay. And well, I've never, I've never come across a utility that had, let's say, a ten percent or less. I mean, I'm sure they're out there, but none of the ones I deal with have I seen that. Yeah. And so, how did the residents of Gulfport react to the deployment of of advanced meters? Um, and then, just as a follow up to that, even if there wasn't a nominal rate increase, you know, being fully billed for water usage is is sort of a functional rate increase, right? It is. It is, mm -hmm. but uh, when when uh, uh, what I've learned over time is, um, believe it or not, uh, uh, people don't mind paying uh, if you can show them what the right amount is. They have no problem paying that amount if you could show them. But if you can't show them, uh, that's a problem. And we're able to show them through, you know, uh, uh, water when they use their water. At what point in time everything comes on? If, if for example, they have a leak, we're able to to work with them and give them leak adjustments. Uh, in the past and say, okay, you have 30 or 60 days to go get a plumber. You produce the plumber receipts where you fix the leak and everything will be good going back and forth its own. To me, that's something we were able to do in Gulfport that we were never able to do before because we just didn't know. Now yeah. we have the technology in place to know for a fact that a person, you know, water's running 24 hours a day consistently. There's probably a leak there. It's probably a toilet running uh, more than what it should. So. Um, I, I thought it went well, uh, although people had to pay more money for their water. At least they knew they were being billed fairly and accurately what they what they were using. Yeah, Mike, right. Mike, you hit you hit the nail on the head there. People don't mind paying as long as you can paying more as long as you can show the corresponding increase in value to them. Right. So um, yes. and that's that's where I think that's where a lot of the services contracts come in is because you're able to, you know, clearly show them what they're getting for the additional dollars that they're that they're paying. Absolutely. Um, we have a, a really good question that came in here from a, a utility. This question reads, uh, neighboring utilities uh, who have converted to AMI have warned us against it based on unexpected burdens, uh, burdensome burdens, uh, such as short uh, battery life, uh, you know, re uh, that needs replacement. Uh, have you seen any improvements in that area in recent years or you know I, I guess that's a little short on detail there about no, like, this, the this, other this, problems they've had this this is this is a great question andrew and i wish we i wish we had yeah. more than, than two minutes to, to talk about it um so the short answer to that question is that's a lot of the reason why we're seeing utilities transition to services contracts right is because um, and, and part of it has to do with unexpectedly, you know, unexpected product failure. Um, but it more so has to do with the fact that technology is just advancing at such a rapid pace now that um, the traditional 20 year life expectancy of a system just isn't realistic anymore. Right. Like there, there's just no way that you're going to be able to put essentially a computer in the ground and let it sit there for 20 years and assume that it's going to continue to operate at the same level of effectiveness in year 20, right? So, um, so yes, there are improvements on the technology itself. However, I will say just the nature of the industry itself is lending itself more so to 
a shorter time frame of technology because of the rapid technology improvements. And that's why more utilities are looking at these services contracts rather than this outright capital expense. Mike, do you have any perspective on that? Being, you know, being more on the municipal side, you know, having having worked on that side of it, uh, just, you know, when it comes to evaluating technologies, uh, just in, in general, whether it's, you know, AMI metering or some other area, is that, I mean, would you kind of agree with 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 what Jacob kind of laid out there? It's not easy to kind of, you know, commit to something for, for 20 years because it's going to be outdated pretty soon. No, I absolutely agree. And, uh, a lot of times the technology is changing faster than what the folks uh, are using to keep tr keep up with it. So that's why I would, you know, highly recommend when you put a system in that you have some way of uh, outsourcing uh, some of the, the functionality of managing that to an outsider like UMS. Absolutely. Um, one one last question here that I think uh, would be just a good one to end on. Um, and again, I, I think we've covered a, a little bit of this, but we're, we're at the hour mark, so I, I think I, we should probably wrap up here. Um, knowing that a lot of uh, return on AMI projects, uh, and as Jacob, you, you mentioned this quite a bit, that you know we're not the benefits are, are also non-financial. Um, how do you make the case to a, a board or a city council that you should be spending you know this amount of money on? Um, you know, on AMI or on these upgrades uh, without really being able to give a specific uh, financial return? Yeah, and I think that's a tough question because it's going to vary um, from utility to utility, right? So a lot of it will depend on on the specific issues that, that you're dealing with in your utility. Um, but I think it's it really boils down to um, customer expectations, right? So I think the, the main the main driver for a lot of these municipalities for moving to, to AMI is customers are expecting more data. They're expecting more information. Um, they're expecting it in real time. They're expecting it delivered to their smartphones, right? And so the idea of sending out a bill once a month or once a quarter and assuming that customers are going to be okay with that um, is starting to kind of fall by the wayside. And so I think, um, you know, where we've seen utilities and municipalities be successful at selling on the non-financial component, and you still can to a certain degree sell on the financial side of it, right? Mike laid out a, a great case with the city of Gulfport for how they saved a ton of money with, with moving to that AMI system. So there still are financial considerations, um, but I think if you want to sell on the non-financial considerations, it's really around customer expectations. Mike, anything to, to add to that? Again, just coming from, from your perspective and, you know, communicating to city councils and city governments for, you know, for money for AMI projects and that sort of thing. How do you, how do you go about making the case considering the range of benefits? Well, I actually, you know, had to take a bloodbath with our city council because I'm wanting to borrow $9 million from where everybody's <laughs> cutting their budgets. But I uh, put my neck on the line and, uh, it, you know, got them convinced that it's going to be a money maker from the meter standpoint. And uh, and it was. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, I was able to uh, hold my credibility, but it was hard going down that road. It really was, especially during the times that we were trying to do this. Yeah. Well, Gentlemen, I think we covered a, a lot of really good points. Um, we are we are over the hour mark, so I want to go ahead and wrap up. But I know we we may have gotten a couple questions in that we we didn't get to. I'm not sure if any were were coming in right right now. But if there's any that we didn't get to, we will certainly uh, follow up with uh, with these folks offline and, and get these answered. Um, so once again. Thanks everyone for joining our, our water finance management webinar series this afternoon. Uh, I'd like to thank Jacob and Mike once again for their presentation and uh, thank UMS for, for sponsoring this, this webinar. And if anyone would like to reference this webinar, we will have it archived on our website, uh, waterfm.com, if you're not familiar with our website. And uh, with that, I uh, hope everyone has a, a great rest of the day, and we will see everyone on uh, the next uh, Water Finance Management webinar. So, Jacob, Mike, thanks, everyone. Have a good one. All right, take care. Thank you. All.